Ladies and gentlemen, out to Lake Oswego, Oregon we go, and we meet up with Ronnie Bennett from her blog, timegoesby.net. I yes. always have to remember that. And yeah. uh, uh, if she's a little out of sync, it's only because it's Skype. You know, we, we always have to say that. Uh, yeah, some, well. And sometimes there's a glitch, and all of a sudden you're in sync. It's strange. How are you, dear? You are in sync because things are a little better, right? I, I can't see from your point of view. I have to trust what you say. <laughs> well, you, we're, we're talking about the fact that you have uh, a, uh, a little thing going with uh, 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 your uh, CT scan, which you were all worried about, of course, naturally. Mm -hmm. And it came out okay. Came out better than it was supposed to. You know, I drifted there for a moment. You're talking about my my tests, my yeah. cancer tests. Yeah, yeah. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. Um, I was really worried about it. Uh, and then the doctor tells me that the, uh, whatever they call them, lesions in my lung where there's cancer, um, that 50% of them are not visible. That doesn't mean they're not there, but they've shrunk a lot. And the same thing with the one in my peritoneum. Mm -hmm. And he was so pleased with how it works that now we're, we're scheduling the test every two months. He said, if the next one in two months is as good as this one, we will expand the interval in between tests to three months. Wow. So this is good news. Yeah, that's very good news. So, yes. so it won't cure my cancer, but it means I have a longer, healthier life. Well, that that's good. In other words, what it's saying is the the um, um, uh, chemo is doing what it's supposed to do. Yes. Yeah, and that's good news. That's very good news. Yes. Uh, so, so where does it go from here? I guess you just. I just keep going every two weeks for chemo. Mm -hmm. I'm terribly lucky with the chemo that for all of the awful. Side potential side effects they tell me about that you know not everybody gets them all but some of them are pretty awful like oh, I can't even stand the thought of if I lost my fingernails um, that's pretty awful but the worst I've had is chemo fatigue and that's not as bad as it was the first or second time I took this chemo so um, you know I guess I was Mother Teresa in my last life I'm really really lucky wow I'm so I'm so happy. when I saw that news you published it on your blog when I saw that news I kind of went whoop de doo I was like yeah, yeah, yeah me too you know <laughs> me too uh, well yeah but now you were um, let's talk about something uh, I have to tell everybody we this is the second time we've done this interview today because the last time something went wrong with the equipment which was also uh, what was the problem with our marriage but anyway. Uh, now, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, something was wrong. I don't know. If we, we we did 25 sterling wonderful minutes, which it recorded about a minute and 44 seconds of it. And then it like froze up. Uh, and I don't know why. I have no idea. Anyway, I'm tired her now, though. <laughs> she's tired her now. But what we got into uh, the last time, and I think it, 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 we have to kind of reconstruct it here because I think it is important, was that you did a certain kind of therapy, which is, shall we say, not normal therapy. Uh, oh, it's been normal for 10 or 20 what, what, or 40,000 years. Well, but it, look, it was normal. It was normal when I was doing those things. Okay, but <laughs> that, that's not the point. The point is, is that it's still considered unorthodox, maybe. To a certain extent, I mean, it's... Well, let me tell you something tell about Tell them what that. it is. What we're tell talking about is magic mushrooms or psilocybin. And at the end of December, I was able to have a guided trip, mm -hmm. um, the purpose of which was to help my fear of dying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back in the 60s, when everybody was doing magic mushrooms and LSD and smoking lots of pot and stuff, that caused the government to pretty much shut down research into those drugs. Mm -hmm. And since then, very slowly it's come back, and some very big deal research places at Johns Hopkins and at NYU and the University of California and 40 or 50 other places have been testing it with volunteers for things like P PTSD, anxiety, 
depression, and I think maybe even schizophrenia. And it showed remarkable results in helping people with these conditions. And in fact, using psilocybin and some other psychedelics for this kind of treatment and therapy is on the ballot for 2020 in Oregon and in Denver. And it's really becoming acceptable to the public, more than half, something like I think 70% in a recent survey approved the use of these psychedelics for these Mm -hmm. purposes. So this is very exciting. And one of the things I've done is tell my doctors when I'm seeing them, Mm -hmm. my cancer doctors, and what's I just had lunch with some friends who were telling me that they mentioned it to their physician, the the woman, the the wife of the couple I had had, uh, lunch with, had mentioned it to her, uh, her doctor, and mm-hmm. he got very excited about it, and he knew a lot about it. He'd read Michael Pollan's book about it. And the same thing has happened with the three or four doctors at my medical center that I've told about it. They're all wildly interested in how much this could help. So I think that we're finally on the way to being able to use this kind of therapy to great good use for a lot of people. It's not just end of life that I use it for. People use it in midlife for those things that I mentioned, anxiety, depression, hmm. PTSD, and other conditions. So it's very exciting that it, it, because of the tests that have been done, more than 90% of the participants found that it worked for them. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that doesn't happen too much in life. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. In uh, now this was not cheap, right? This cost you this some. This is bucks. not what. This was not cheap. Uh, the the in my the in, in what I did, it was not. It, it it will not be wildly expensive in the future. Yeah, once it's made, how can we? Is legal the word here? Well, the, the point is, is to make it legal at least, it, you know how marijuana in the states where it's legal first started as a medical thing and then they expanded it to mm-hmm. recreational? Yeah. I suspect this will follow the same trajectory. That mm-hmm. First it will be allowed for experimental treatment and then it will expand. Okay, now let's, let's backtrack a little bit here and ask, what was your specific reason for going for the therapy? What kind of anxiety did you have? It, it just the most horrible attacks of fear about dying from the cancer. Mm-hmm. I mean, really. I mean, it was like every cell in my body would kind of shake like this, and I, and I couldn't even think, and it would go on for two or three minutes, maybe four, before it faded away. It was just, and it would happen to me two or three times a day. Wow. And it was just, and it wasn't that I always was. I always knew I was afraid of it, and I had looked into these kinds of drugs long before Michael Pollan's book, and long before. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I knew that if I was ever in a position in my life like I am now where, you know, they're telling me that, you know, this disease is going to kill me, there's nothing that can cure it, Mm -hmm. I always knew I would look to do this long, long, long before I had cancer. So I was able to. It's not easy to find somebody to be your guide, but I was terribly lucky and found somebody who could help me Well, to begin with, they have to have, A, the drug. B, they have to be able to guide you. They have to be good at what they do. And yes. so how did you, when you shopped for somebody, and I'm sure you did, I'm sure you didn't take the first person that came along, what what what, what kind of questions did you have to ask and what, what kind of information well, did you have to have? first of all, you can't just call up somebody. Nobody knows. It's a Schedule One drug. Yeah. If these people are caught, they go to jail. Okay. I mean, this is not fooling around stuff. Yeah. So you don't just look it up on the internet you know, and call somebody. Um, it has to go through word of mouth. Mm-hmm. And that's what I had to do. And I got terribly lucky because if I still lived in New York, mm-hmm. I think I still know enough about the uh, underground drug market that I could have messed around and found somebody to do this. I don't know that where I live now. I don't know how to do that here. Mm-hmm. And I just got lucky that... A friend of mine, who we had never, ever, ever discussed this, Mm -hmm. saw a report about my cancer online. Right. And sent me a very, very short email that said, are you interested? He A couple of other things. And then he said, are you interested in end-of-life psychedelics? 
Well, I was right in the middle of trying to figure out how I was going to find someone to do this with. And he pointed the way and it worked out beautifully. Yeah. And uh, what, once you got a hold of the person, it was easy enough to get them to go along with you or did you have to we go We had an hour and a half conversation. I think she wanted to be sure she could trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very sorry. I just said she. And um, uh, we, as I said, we talked for a long time. We came to like each other. We talked a lot about what the experience would be, mm -hmm. what our experiences, both hers as a as a guide and me as a, I took some drugs back in the 60s. We did that together, you know. Would, and, would you be mm -hmm. revealing too much if I, if I were to, if you were to answer my question about, did this person uh, have some kind of uh, credentials? In other words, uh, being a, do is, a doctor uh, or a psychiatrist? Is, 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 is giving people a piece of paper about this. It's very widespread. There are many people doing this guidance. Mm. Um, and um, but sometimes you would find that, for instance, a psychiatrist might do this on the side. No, he wouldn't. As an example. Why not? Because he is licensed. Oh, OK. And would go to jail. Right. Well, there were there were doctors <laughs> who used to give abortions uh, who were believed in it and uh, took a chance with their own licenses in the old days. That's why I'm asking. Please. Um, well, I know. don't know what you would license. The people who do this, the guides who do this have been doing it for many years. Yeah. Yeah. The person I went to has been doing it for 20 years. Right. They know a lot more than the doctors do about this. Right. Uh, and um, so uh, the, the process is you take the psilocybin. It takes how long? It took how long to, to grab hold? About 40 minutes or something like that? 30 minutes? For me, about 20 minutes. Really? Hmm? And then what was the first image you saw that you suddenly realized you were high? Uh, it was funny. We were in this beautiful room the guide has, and it looks out on the edge of a forest. And in front of the trees were very tall bushes, I'd say like up to my shoulders, but mm -hmm. they were across the way ways, and I was looking out the window. Mm -hmm. And they started doing this, <laughs> the bushes, <laughs> which reminded me of years and years ago and some acid trips. Yes. And, the, and that in was fact, first our first vacation. acid trip. But our mostly it's very interior. It's not so much outside. Our first acid trips we took together. We were living out in that townhouse. And, yes. And that's where we had our first acid trip. Yes. And I remember walking into the bathroom and all of a sudden my face started melting in front of me. And I said, Jesus Christ, I this, didn't stuff, have anything like this that. stuff really this works. much more interior experience. Well, I've. I think I did magic mushrooms once, and each one of these drugs, I mean, LSD is a chemical compound, whereas uh, magic mushrooms are an organic compound, and they have different highs. And if you look at, you know what I seem to remember is I did do magic mushrooms, and or maybe I did, maybe I did mescaline, and, and what I saw was the Rosetta Stone, <laughs> and I figured... Jesus, this is where they this is where they came up with it, you know. I mean, they were high on on on, on mushrooms and and cactus, but um, so you're you're out to to mitigate your fears. Um, what did you discover, and how did you discover it? Well, you can't talk about they really. I mean, even Michael Pollan talks about this in a very very long piece online, ten or twelve pages that there are not words to talk about what an experience is. It's just, he said he felt like a jerk when you start saying, oh, I just felt like there was peace everywhere and there, peace on earth, you know, and you feel like such a jerk saying yeah. things like that. And, and, and you find yourself saying that over and over because there are not the words for it. Right. It just doesn't exist. And um, it, it uh, in my case, you know, certainly there are hallucinations, not, not ever scary ones with me, but there were lots and lots of doors that went into white, empty rooms. They were all white and no furniture, just empty. Um, and then eventually I went through one, the door was ajar, and I went, you know, behind it. I went from here and the stairs around it. And it was then on that one, after I'd done that several times, that I came to see, feel, believe, I don't know what's the right word, that dying was only the other side of living and it was perfectly okay. That you can't have one without the other. Um, 
as with everything on earth everything is born and lives and dies yeah i mean it, and it, it's that an, was okay it's as yeah. it should be yeah and i wonder sometimes if because in this country and maybe a lot of western countries we have hidden death away it doesn't happen around the family anymore and people aren't there when somebody is dying unless they're hanging out in the hospital or uh, you know some other place with someone but we don't make it part of life the way it was for most of the history of humankind mm -hmm. um, and so it's a great mystery we're not allowed to talk about it uh, and and it makes a lot of fear um, and I think particularly since this cancer came along and particularly since the magic mushroom session um, that that it the dying is part of living. It should be part of our lives. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, that was true. About half my friends when I was a kid had a grandparent living with them. Some were healthy, some were not. Right. But the kids were just as much a part of taking care, if that was necessary, of the grandparent as the parents were. And we mostly don't do that. We don't have our grandparents in our homes anymore. We don't see old people as they get older and what happens to them. Yeah. That all happens in secret now. Yeah. So we don't know very much about dying anymore. So you went through this experience, uh, and, and uh, by the way, when you see these doors and so on, were your eyes open? Were you close? Were they closed? No, they were closed. They were closed. So you were you were uh, uh, dreaming a lot of don't this. Don't try to be too specific about no, it. It's well, not talkable well, about that way. I'm curious. What can no, I no, say? no. It's not yeah. about curiosity. I'm telling you that those questions can't be answered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody once said to me, I mean, about marijuana, just something as simple as marijuana, uh, can you describe your mar a marijuana high? And it's very hard to describe. You, you, can, you can use all kinds of words like, well, you're a little all of this and that, and you, but you can't really describe the feeling. Well, but, except that you're really yeah. slow and you eat a lot of candy. No, well, <laughs> they, yeah. Anyway, uh, so the the question I have here is now you're through with this, and it lasted how long? How long did the session last? I guess about five hours. About five hours, and um, uh, you you come back home, and now has that fear kind of mitigated itself, complete uh, or you mean completely as, as or I lost it? Have you lost it, or no. do you you still live with the fear, but you understand it? No, I just don't feel very afraid of it. I see. Okay. So what this did is help you deal with the fear. That was the point. Yeah. I mean, and what we did, you know, I arrived at the guy's house the night before we were going to do that and we had dinner mm -hmm. and it was explained to me how what would happen and how we would do this and mm -hmm. and uh what, and I was asked to talk about what my goal was, which was to deal with fear of dying. Mhm. Mm uh, I think I also added, and hey, you know, if you could throw that in, I'd like to know what the meaning of life is. <laughs> yeah, if you could just get a little extra bonus, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so we had breakfast the next morning, and uh, and she measured out the mushrooms, and uh, you know, a certain <clears throat> a certain amount depending on my weight, and <clears throat> excuse me, and um, and we did that. Yeah. And uh, and then we. The next morning, I stayed another night, mm -hmm. and the next morning we talked about uh, living with it and what it should what, mean what, to my life. You know, I have a paralyzing fear of death. It always, I always have, um, and ever since I was a kid. Uh, and now that I get closer <laughs> to that point, I'm even more depressed by it. Could if if this became legal for medicinal purposes okay could you see this as a, just for somebody like myself who's not dying but who wants to deal with course, the latter of part of my life it's not about dying i mean most people midlife it's not that they have a disease that's going to kill them mm -hmm. they have issues whether it's anxiety depression ptsd some other conditions yeah that they want to explore and try to help themselves with um it uh, and it seems to work dramatically, as I told you about the the research that's being done. Yeah. Um, and uh, and one of the reasons that I've read about it being used on people like me who are old and and facing dying, right, is that you know that that these research hospitals have to get permission 
from the FDA to use this to do research with because mm -hmm. it's a Schedule One drug. Right. And one of the ways that they are been able to get those permissions, I think, from what I've read, is that they tell the politicians and the people that are all scared that we might have a little fun, you know, with this, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm having a, a chemo brain moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, is that if they tell these people that can give permissions um, that we're going to do this with these old people because of their fear of dying, it's easier for politicians or administrators who make these decisions to say, oh, well, they're old anyway. Go ahead and try it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a foot in the door for other people and, yeah. and moving the, uh, the idea forward that we actually um, you know, can treat people with these psychedelic drugs that um, people have ignored for too long, and and for I mean, for for centuries before us, people have used these well, drugs I, to good effect. I, I always felt that LSD got a bad shake because well, not of, just all of all of the yeah, psychedelics. because back. I think there were definite legitimate uses for LSD, and well, and I think a lot of Americans do because of that survey that I saw that way yeah. over half. Um, approve the use of how it was used for me and how the researchers wish to use it. Listen, before we get to the end of this, I've got to ask you a question, okay? Yeah, sure. Renee Collins, do you know Renee Collins? Of course I know Renee Collins. She's a regular caller to my uh, my podcast, but she hasn't called me in about, oh, about a month and a half or so. Uh, and uh, it usually happens around this time of the year. So I wrote her and I said that I was wondering if she was okay and so on and she wrote back and she said yeah i'm okay but it's that time of the year my husband died this time of the year and i kind of go into hibernation and you know it was a very nice letter back and then at the end she said uh, could you give me ronnie's address i'd like to send her a pineapple well apparently she did more than a pineapple right uh well see i got this box yesterday that went that weighed almost nothing yeah with this little envelope Mm -hmm. With a card in it mm -hmm. for a gift certificate to Whole Foods. Whole Foods. From her. Right. From her. Isn't that nice? That's, uh, you know, who knows? No Maybe. pineapple, just what, unless they have them for sale at Whole Foods. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's, but, she, she, but she sent me a note and said that if I wanted a pineapple, let her know. Yeah. <laughs> she's very nice. No, well, she, uh, she uh, lives in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, she. That's where the pineapple stuff comes Yeah, from. and okay. I and when she asked for your address, sometimes I'm I'm a little reticent to give out addresses and so on. But in in this case, I thought it would be a very nice thing because she's a very nice lady. And so, you know her, so that's. Okay. Yeah, I know her. Yeah, she. In fact, when I was inducted into the uh, Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame, she came to my induction. Oh, that's nice. You know, that's nice. I, I didn't even know her at the time. I think I had met her. Maybe the first time there. So she's been a fan for years. And she said she was watching your stuff. And, you know, she, she's really been taken back by, by this. And I, I told you this when we recorded earlier. I'm going to say it again. I think what you're doing is very, very important. Not for, it, It's th probably therapeutic on some level for you. But I think it's very helpful to people who are in the same situation. Although, as you have said, everybody's mileage may vary. Yes. But certainly hearing somebody talk about it can make them feel better about it and about the trip they're taking, you know. Well, one of the things that I ran into when I was first diagnosed and thinking about what was I going to say on the blog or not say and what this was all about mm -hmm. um, is that um, most of what is written for people who have medical death sentences, maybe we mm -hmm. could call them, you know, mm -hmm. Um, is it's mostly written from caregiver's point of view. 95% of it that's any good that I could find was from caregiver's point of view. And they talk about taking care of the, of the patient as though they're a little kid in a lot of ways and can't make their own mm -hmm. decisions. Now, certainly there are people that you know, have problems that they can't make decisions for themselves, but most of us can. And yeah. nobody has much written about it from the patient's point of view of what you go through, right. what your doubts are, what you're scared of, what you is okay, how you come to live with this. Mm -hmm. and, 
um, and all the stuff that comes up, and the silly little things too. I mean, I, I just mentioned chemo brain. Right after chemo, every two weeks, you know, for two or three days, it's like right now talking to you. That there's some fuzzy cloud between me and the screen. So, <laughs> you know, my brain just isn't as functional as yeah. it will be in another day or two again. Um, and what's that? What that's like? I can, if I'm trying to write something, I, if I concentrate during chemo brain. I can do it if I really concentrate hard. What I can't do mm -hmm. is follow instructions very well, like if I were trying to do a recipe, yeah. and it said, you know, two-thirds cup of sugar, and the next thing it said a teaspoon of salt. If I walked away to get those things, I would forget what I was looking for. You yeah. know? So it doesn't work very that well. That happens to me, and I'm not even on chemo. So, you know. And me? <laughs> it, that happens to me, and I'm not even on chemo. <laughs> Anyway, hey, listen, we've run out of time, but I want to remind people that you can be found at uh, timegoesby.net, and uh, hopefully uh, we can hear from you again in another couple of weeks and discuss more. This has been great, and I hope it recorded this time. I do, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ronnie Bennett. Thanks, Ronnie. You're welcome. Thank you.